Okay, hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, we called our meeting to order during our closed executive session, so we can begin our meeting. Um, I guess we will start with Dr. Adderhold. Do you have any comments? No? Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, as we have uh, two presentations this evening, um, I'm just going to make one brief uh, comment, and I just want to recognize our three incumbent board members who were uh, successful in re-election. Uh, so I want to congratulate Loy Maliga, Sweth Shetty, and Dana Krug on their re-election to the Board of Education. Thank them for their service and recognize the next uh, three-year commitment they just made. So thank you to all of you um, for your service to the board. Thank you, Dr. Adderhold. Okay, so we, we're now going to go to our student representative reports. So if we can start, I guess, with High School North. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? All right, cool. So starting off, all of our clubs at High School North are officially in full swing. Most of them are meeting in either advisor rooms or UDH now, which has been set up. And we also have opened fall club applications, and they're running right now. So we're excited to see what new clubs apply so we can help speed the process next year. In addition, fall sports are coming to a close or already have closed. Most sports already had their banquets. And winter sports signups opened last week, and most tryouts are going to be held next week. Um, a month ago, North hosted its annual college fair with over 100 college representatives attending, and overall was great success. A great success. A lot of kids were able to go and help see what like type of colleges they might want to apply for as college season comes up. In addition, we had our PSATs for sophomores and juniors. This year's PSAT was digital, so it was a little bit more of a logistical challenge, but it was overall very smooth. Um, a couple weeks ago, we also had our in first in-person back to school night ever since COVID hit, and we received a lot of positive feedback, especially from parents. And I've, a lot of parents switched places with students and attended all their classes that night. And a lot of teachers also had a great opportunity to meet parents. All right. Thank you, Johnson. Moving on, during Halloween weekend, the National Honor Society held their national annual trunk or treat event. Students decorated their cars and dressed up in costumes. And family and kids from all over the community came to collect candies from these students. This year, we had amazing turnout, and we are looking forward to next year's event. Additionally, many seniors have officially applied to their first colleges through early admissions. Fingers crossed we hear back a lot of acceptances. <laughs> <laughs> Last week, the signups for all AP tests have closed. And finally, this Monday marks the last day of the first marking period. We are en now entering our second marking period. And to end off this, um, this weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the HSN Fall Drama is holding their annual fall show. This year, our theater department is hosting the show on mid at Midsummer Night. I hope you guys can make it. Moving on to our South representatives. Okay, thank you, Johnson. Thank you, Mahir. Okay, so now let's talk about High School South. Okay, so um, about, about a month ago, a little over a month ago, we had our homecoming, uh, as mentioned in the last meeting, and we announced this year's homecoming Pirates crew, which consisted of three South seniors, Rory, Maya, and Vinny. We, like Johnson said, we also had our PSATs for our sophomores and juniors. So luckily, as a senior, I got to sleep in. Um, and then we had our college fair at North um, and our back to school night as well. We also had our National Honor Society cakewalk, which was held during lunch um, to raise funds for the National Honor Society. And our Red Cross blood drive, perfectly timed on Halloween. So. Um, on November 1st as well, knowing that it was a very important day for our South seniors, our PTSA gave our seniors a sweet treat, a Ziploc bag of, a Ziploc bag of candy um, on our way out of lunch. We also had our orchestra buddy night um, about last week, I think, uh, where Grover students came and spent a Friday evening bonding with the South Ensemble. Then the student council also flagged our lawn by placing um, little American flags on the lawn in front of High School South, which you can see as you're driving by. Uh, this year, this, this season, I guess, has also been pretty significant for uh, South's athletic and musical departments in that seven students, seven of our South students participated in the 94th New, Year New Jersey Music Educator Educators Association All-State Mixed Choir and Orchestra. 
Um, and for track, our senior Catherine Gobo finished with a time of 21.13 at the NJSIAA XC Meet of Champs. Um, our United Cheer team also took first place in traditional non-tumbling last Sunday, last last Sunday, um, at the CBC Cheered competition. And our girls tennis had a particularly successful season, winning sectional states and the CBC championship as well. Okay, and then coming up in the near future, we have our our fall drama, our Romeo and Juliet, the theme being Romeo and Juliet. Um, this weekend at High School South with our tickets being sold in the Playhouse during lunch. Um, and our cast is doing a performance for all the ninth grade students tomorrow. Um, right now, the student council is in the midst of planning their winter pep rally and des deciding on their spirit week themes. Um, and we just, as a whole, have a lot of exciting musical concerts coming up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And. Um, you're of course welcome to stay if you'd like, but I also we also understand that you have schoolwork, so if you if you have to to go, um, we completely understand. But you're welcome to stay as well. Thank you. All right. So our our next presentation is the program of studies presentation. So can I ask our chief academic officer, Dr. Gould, uh, to come up? Good evening, uh, families and Board of Education. Thank you for um, having me this evening. I have the pleasure of sharing with you tonight the program of studies changes for the 2024 and 2025 school year. So for tonight's agenda, I'd like to take you through um, some of our program of studies timeline, as well as um, the process in which students undertake for scheduling their courses at the high school level, as well as our additions to the program of studies in terms of our courses, and some of our program of studies changes that are being recommended. So first, thinking through our program of studies timeline, um, I wanted to share with all of you and invite you to join us for our incoming ninth grade program of studies webinar uh, for High School South will be hosted at, on January 31st and for North on February 1st. And this year, we're also adding an additional program of studies night um, for a webinar for our parents, for students uh, 10th through 12th grade. And we have not offered this opportunity in the past, but we really hope to be able to focus the incoming ninth grade program of studies on ninth grade offerings and then offer the 10th through 12th grade um, to focus parents and families and students on the offerings um, for students that are available for 10th through 12th grade, and also for our new families, for families that were not able or were not with us in WWP um, as ninth graders. And so that will be hosted on February 7th. So that's an addition that we're adding to our process. The other thing that's important just to note, um, so our schedule requests happen, uh, students and guardians happen in Genesis, and that happens in February. So around the end of February through March, uh, parents and students will have the opportunity to enter their requests in Genesis, and then students will begin the process of meeting with their school counselors. They meet with their school counselors one-to-one, -one, every student, including our incoming ninth graders. So the high school north and high school south counselors will visit CMS and GMS and meet with every student one-to-one uh, -one and go through all of the different opportunities and talk through course, course eligibility. And then they will help students to finalize uh, their requests for the following year uh, during that timeline. And parents also um, should do that in Genesis as well. And then um, for change requests, and this is important to note as well, so students will have the opportunity to make course and level change requests from August 1st through February, uh, through August 15th. So sometime in August we will send out information and um, students will have the opportunity to make changes if they wanted, you know, they have a reconsideration or they want to change one of their courses. And of course, you know, that is based on whether or not we have room in that course. So please um, make sure that you fill out that form if you're interested in making a change. 
And then for ninth grade, we will offer an additional time because this is the first time that ninth graders are experiencing levels especially. Um, and also many of them are in multi-level classes as ninth graders and so it doesn't impact their schedule as much. So they will have the opportunity from September 15th through October 15th to make level change requests. And their counselors send out information and we also send out district information about that process as well to families and um, to students. So I'm excited to share with you some of our new course offerings that will be available through our program of studies for next year. So one of our new courses is an elective course, um, which is um, Advanced Placement African American Studies. And this course will be available and offered for grades 10 through 12. And the prerequisite for this course will be successful uh, completion of at least one full year course in social studies at the high school level. And um, this course will take a look at African American experiences, um, looking at African kingdoms all the way through contemporary history. It will uh, utilize not only his historical context and lens analysis, but also looking at literary skills as well and really develop that critical thinking and analytical skills for students. Another really exciting um, course that we have available is Unified Physical Education. And this course will be offered to our um, juniors and seniors. Unified Physical Education uh, will be offered for the semester of physical education for our juniors, which happens in the fall. So not for their health component, but for physical education. And then for our seniors, which happens in the spring. Um, and this will be a mixed ability classroom, so we'll have students with um, special needs and their unified peers working in collaboration, participating in sports activities, um, and our unified peers will be working with our students with special needs and providing additional assistance, acting as role models and peers. In this course, uh, we will have an application process um, you know, in order to be able to do this, and this is a really exciting opportunity for students we have done a pilot at the middle school and it's been really successful to see that collaboration um, and it's had a really positive impact not only through physical education but also in developing those friendships outside of the classroom as well and so we're really excited about offering this course. Another new course that we have available will be Dance 3. So this is a continuation of Dance 1 and 2. And we will offer Dance 3 as either college prep or for honors credit as well. Um, students will be able to you know, really develop their dance technique. This course takes it a step further, taking a look at choreography, um, having students create their own choreography and really study performance and how to enhance their dance skills as it relates to performance. Music Technology 3 is another continuation course um, that will allow students who have been studying music technology either 1 and 2 to continue. Again, this course will be offered as either college prep or honors. Um, and this course takes a look at audio entertainment engineering and applying um, music, you know, taking a look at digital music and instruments and the creation of music through technology, um, really developing students' technical skills and being able to, you know, foster that love of music in a different way. Another available course that we'll have is Sculpture and Ceramics uh, 2, which is a continuation from Sculpture and Ceramics uh, 1, which will also be offered as college prep or honors. Um, and students here will be able to apply for a portfolio review, meaning that if they have experience with sculpture and ceramics, they can apply for a portfolio review and not have to take Ceramics 1 um, first. And so that is something that we have also added in as a possibility because we do have students that study this outside of school and might be interested in, and we've utilized that portfolio review um, as a process in other courses and have found that to be very successful. 
So this takes a look at art and being able to express your artistic um, talents in a different way. Um, really looking at you know sculptures and being able to apply glazing techniques um, and creation uh, through making and the, the physical act of making art. Another change to the program of studies is that we've taken a look at all of our level two elective courses um, and we will be offering those level two elective courses as either college prep or honors. Um, and we, we really hope that by doing this, we are able to you know, work with students to choose paths that they are really passionate about and to choose courses that they want to continue in. Um, and really pursue that next level of something that they are, you know, really um, feel great about and want to pursue a deeper understanding of. And so teachers in some of these areas have already been, you know, working on paths with extending learning and being able to work with students on taking it to that next level, deepening their understanding. Um, and so they will do that through their projects, you know, extending their projects and thinking about the activities that students are engaged in and students will have the opportunity to choose whether to engage in these courses through a college prep level or honors um, in a multi-level classroom. So we've done that for all of our level two courses, as you can see here. Other updates to the program of studies. Um, we updated the course level eligibility for eighth grade. Uh, we are no longer in marking periods in eighth grade. We now have uh, trimesters. So we just adjusted the eligibility so that um, we take, are taking a look at the average between trimester one and two for eligibility into ninth grade courses for our eighth graders. Um, we also updated Mercer County Technical Schools is our technical school partnership uh, for West Windsor Plains Rural School District. They have added their full day um, and full, um, full programs into our program of studies as well. So they have full academies that are also available and those are now in our program of studies. Um, we used to have a partnership with Middlesex um, Technical Schools. But, and parents can still pr pursue that, but that has a tuition involved with it, whereas Mercer County Technical Schools does not involve tuition, and we are partners with them. And so take a look, they have great both part-time programs and also full-time programs as well. Um, so those are available in our program of studies. We have removed uh, printmaking as a course. Um, we just haven't run that course in a number of years, and we just haven't had interest in that. And so that has been removed from the program of studies. Um, physics of astronomy can now be considered as a third lab uh, science for graduation requirements. We also removed the prerequisite for emerging financial markets. It used to be intro to computer programming was a prerequisite and no longer is. So students can enter into emerging financial markets without that prerequisite. Um, again, it was a, those skills were not necessary and were not found to be needed in that course uh, for students to be successful. And then um, we also changed, changed uh, youth, teaching youth from pass fail to receiving a letter grade as well. And the final um, change to the program of studies was a recommendation for our advanced uh, placement testing process. And so um, we are adding in language in our pro program of studies that if a student, um, in, in order to take the AP exam in WWP, a student must be enrolled in the course. So if we offer a course, in West Windsor Plainsboro, and here's the list of all of the courses that we offer. A student must be enrolled in the course in order to take the exam in WWP. The exam is offered, all of the AP exams are offered throughout the state of New Jersey. It is difficult to find another location, however you can find other places that administer the assessment. Um, so, you know, we really are doing this because of a number of different reasons. One. You know, if we offer the course, we want our students engaged in the learning. We, you know, think that, that it's a benefit 
for students to have that deep learning and to be a part of the course, uh, the interactions, you know, what happens with the teaching, that, you know, live instruction with our teachers and with our classmates in the class, as well as, you know, there is an instructional impact. Um, we have a number of um, students that take the AP exams. Last year, at each of our high schools, we had about close to 1,800 exams administered at each high school. Um, the time for the exams takes about two week time period and um, it is, takes a toll on our facilities, meaning that we are essentially utilizing most of our staff members to assess students. You know, our counselors, our teachers, um, our AP teachers, which means that they are not in the classroom instructing kids because they're administering exams. And so, you know, we also want, we, we just, it, it's, a very, it's very difficult to be able to administer this number of exams as well. So for, for those reasons, you know, we are um, making this recommendation to, if we have students enrolled in the courses, and that this will cut down about 300, the impact will be about 300 exams total across the district. Um, you know, we are offering other opportunities to students, so we do have a dual enrollment um, for TC and J. For example, we have students that are taking um, courses through um, our AP courses, and then they're also getting credit through TC and J for dual enrollment, and we're exploring opportunities through other community colleges, such as Middlesex, that has a state transfer agreement in order to be able to get um, credit as well at other community colleges. So we're looking at those opportunities for students as well. So this is another recommendation for a change. And those are all the changes for 24, 25. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Gould. Are there any questions from board members, Dana? Okay, we were we were testing the microphone before. Sure. Um, so I wanted to say thank you for all the work that you, that um, your team did and that mm -hmm. the, the board committee did um, on updating the program of studies for our high school. And I, I just wanted to highlight a couple of the things that I'm excited about. You know, I'm, I'm the former curriculum chair, so I, I get excited <laughs> about curriculum. So um, the, the webinar for the 10th to 12th grade um, info session, I think that's, it's really good. It helps, will help answer a lot of people's questions. Um, the new AP course is exciting. Um, unified, uh, the unified PE and the dance, the music tech and sculpture and ceramics. And I think um, that it's really good that um, we're gonna have honors options for level two courses across most of the um, disciplines. So I appreciate that and, um, and that's it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dana. Any other comments? Yep, Graylin. Thanks for the presentation and the update. Um, quick question about the uh, the partnership with Mercer County Technical Schools. Um, are Plainsboro residents eligible to yes. attend Mercer? Cool. Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Louisa. Uh, for some of the new classes, is there a minimum number of students that have to sign up for the class to run? And are some of the classes like the adding a level three, are those going to be entirely separate classrooms or would those be level two and level three taught together with different assessments? So what we've tried to do when we're building a class, um, you know, if we, we technically try to run a class with at least 10 students, however, if we can't because we don't have 10, we do sometimes combine like a level two or a level three together so that we are able to run um, the courses and we don't have to cut a particular course uh, so that we can build momentum for a particular class. So we've done that, for example, this year, we are running dance one and two as a combined course and we hope that we are able to, you know, continue to build. And if we need to do that for dance two and three, you know, we will so that we can offer the course to students and make as many courses available as possible. Okay. Any other, Liz? Thank you also for the presentation. Um, a question about the AP African American Studies course mm -hmm. and the mention of data analysis, I guess it's analysis skills. What does that mean? Are you talking about some type of public policy type of um, 
approach. So it. they'll take a look at, you know, policies, they'll take a look at, you know, different um, movements that have taken place and analyze the impact. Um, they will take a look at, you know, uh, different historical documents that may have had an impact on, um, you know, people and communities. Um, and there are recommended resources for that particular course. So College Board will put out a recommended list and then, you know, we have to adopt based off of their recommendations. Um, we have to utilize one of their texts for that. And then just one other question. Sure. So the Unified Physical Education, it's, uh, I see here it's for grades 11 through 12. Is it possible to start it perhaps in the 10th grade? with the consideration of doing it. So we can take a look at that maybe in coming years. It also has to do with like PE requirements, right? So the, the reason why it works well in 11th and 12th grade is because we can do it as a semester and the way it's broken up with health. Mm -hmm. So right now in 11th grade, um, 11th graders can take take PE for the first half of the year and then they have health mm -hmm. and then they have a PE cycle so that way they would be in the unified for the first half of the year and they, they have that two marking periods together. Mm -hmm. um, and then senior year it's the opposite. They would have it in the spring. Mm -hmm. uh, so it doesn't work quite as nicely <laughs> with 10th grade. Mm -hmm. I believe 10th grade has health because they have driver's ed mm -hmm. and it's broken up a little bit differently. So we can take a look if there's a way to manipulate the schedule differently, mm -hmm. but that's why it works really well with 11th and 12th grade for now. Okay. Thank you for the diversity of courses offered. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Are there any other questions from board members or comments? Okay. I think we're done. Thank you, Dr. Gould. All right, so that we'll uh, now go to our next presentation, the school start time exploration presentation. So can I ask Dr. McDonald, our deputy superintendent, to come up? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Juliana. Uh, good evening, everyone. This work uh, and presentation that I'm about to present represents the work of many community stakeholders over the last six months, uh, specifically around school start time, the idea that we may at some point in the future uh, move forward with the idea that we would push back start times at the high school level, possibly the middle school. That really was the focus of this work. Uh, to engage in a process where we reviewed uh, various facets of this work. Um, but that being said, I want to first recognize the committee uh, that was put together that involves many stakeholders from throughout the school community, including our Board of Education, including parents, including students, uh, community members, administrators from all different levels, administrators with expertise and backgrounds in specific areas such as transportation, health and wellness, um, technology and whatnot, uh, community education. So their input, their feedback, uh, their conversations along the way over the last six months have really been critical in helping us understand uh, what this potentially could look like. Um, at the end of the day, our goal here over the last six months was really about better understanding uh, what a school district might have to do, what WWP might have to consider. It was never about telling the board, yes, we think we sh you should do this, per se, right? Uh, I've been in the district almost 15 years, 14, 15 years. Uh, when we think about major topics, initiatives, um, we, we do our due diligence. We make sure that we do the applicable research. We make sure that we understand the different facets. Uh, we make sure that we thoroughly understand something before we just jump into it. And that's really what this work was all about. Uh, so I really want to thank those committee members. Uh, from the onset, our goals were pretty straightforward and they did not change throughout uh, the last six months. Uh, and I believe that we accomplished the goals in terms of better understanding uh, research as it relates to sleep and start times, uh, extracurricular activities, the potential impact there, uh, grade levels, child care, work schedules, family schedules, and various outcomes. 
topics including looking at that research, which I'll highlight shortly, uh, analyzing the family schedules, child care, grade levels specifically, uh, discussing and reviewing potential uh, scheduling configurations, alternative schedules if you may, uh, looking at transportation, which is a huge one, extracurricular activities, athletics, and certainly thinking about what this means from a district bu uh, budget perspective. Uh, this was not easy, and it's not going to be easy capturing the work of six months in a 20, 25 minute presentation, but I will do my best to honor the work of the team. So that said, uh, this is the first recommendation, which would be a stakeholder survey, and I would just add to this that uh, these recommendations that I'm going to share with you this evening are not necessarily in any particular order, though you might think about how the next logical sequence, if this work were to move forward at some point in the future. Um, having a stakeholder survey, as many communities that have moved forward with this work, is really critical in understanding preferences, both from a student, caregiver, and staff perspective. Uh, understanding health and wellness patterns, for example, in the district, the amount of sleep that children might be getting on an average night. Uh, understanding busing and transportation and how that might impact a particular family. Certainly understanding extracurricular activities, the participation, preferences, and what that might look like with an alternative bell schedule, for example. Uh, aftercare, before care, work schedules for students that uh, are employed in a part-time basis. Part of the committee's work in going through this was um, spending time looking at WWP specifically around extracurricular and athletics. Um, needless to say, you can see here on the PowerPoint, we have a high participation rate. We offer 18 sports at the high school level. We offer another 11 sports at the middle school level. We have over 1,000 and 6,800 students that participate in those sports uh, respectively. We have many extracurricular activities, you name it, uh, we have it. Uh, and if we don't, and a student's interested in it, they have an opportunity to start that work, and we will support them in that regard. Um, middle school, similarly, we have 20 options as well when it comes to extracurricular activities. That's a good thing for the community, and that's, a, that's something we want to make sure that we maintain and we give students every opportunity to move forward with that work. But part of this committee's work was looking at that specifically and those participation rates uh, looking at how that might be impacted, for example, if you started uh, school later in the day, specifically the middle school and the high school level. This, for example, is a, just a sample uh, survey uh, from another community uh, that was discussed in our work along the way. Um, these are things that you might ask, right, related to uh, after concerns regarding after school activities, concerns uh, with parent work schedule. Right, if you were all of a sudden to move back start times, whether it was at a specific grade level or move up uh, a grade level at um, start time at a different level, what that might do to before and after care, uh, what that might do to the average family's expenses when it comes to before and after care. So it was a lot of different conversations uh, that we had along the way regarding those uh, potential uh, challenges, which you'd want to get community stakeholder feedback on. So in thinking about the recommendation with a stakeholder survey, uh, a few talking points that I want to highlight here when you think about the impact of later school start time, coaches and advisors availability. WWP decides to shift their schedule. A number of our staff have their own children. A number of our staff think about a coach or an advisor that may have a young child whose child care may only be a, available to a certain time of day, right? Will they still pursue? being an advisor, being a, uh, being a coach, for example. Um, child care access and capacity, right? I know our, you know, Shannon Martin, our director of community ed, was on the committee. We talked about the capacity of our own EDP program, right? The challenges that we have, uh, we are book solid, right? Can those same, if all of a sudden you make major shifts, for example, in your community, can you accommodate those changes? Can you accommodate the need for uh, before and after care, for example? And can people pay for them? Athletic extracurricular participation, if you shifted your start time, for example, or high schools get out at 2.50 p.m., all of a sudden, an hour later, you think about a practice time going into the evening, and starts, you start to see a lot of different questions in terms of when students might get home for other things that are a priority for them. Um, so you have to think about that athletic and extracurricular activity participation. I'm going to highlight a couple things with busing a little bit later uh, to bring further context to that. 
um, athletic competition and instruction. Um, right now we have athletic contests that may start at four o'clock and sometimes it requires our teams to be dismissed from school early. You, you shift that back, um, you shift up the, their back school time when we start, that potentially would be something that you would also think about that loss of instructional time. Part-time jobs, the same, right? A shop that um, used to employ a student from 3 to 6 p.m., that same student can't get out till 4.30 or, or later. Are they still going to be able to have that part-time job, for example? Second recommendation would be to form a bell schedule committee. And it, it, it sounds simple just to say, and I'm going to share a couple highlights here, uh, just shift the schedule to, from this to this. But there are a lot of things that you really have to consider when you're doing this. Um, of course, you have to identify alternative bell schedules, which we did and we discussed in our committee work. Um, you have to certainly clarify the values for teaching and learning, right? When you think about your program of studies offerings, right? As Dr. Gould just shared, we offer a high number of AP courses. We offer a lot of different offerings to our students. Um, where, what would be the impact of a potential shift in the schedule that you might do? So you really need to understand that on your instructional impact on your instructional program. Um, assess the impact on students, parents, and staff. Again, from a staff perspective, uh, what does their schedule look like? How does it impact their own personal circumstances? From a student perspective, um, what would that look like for them uh, in terms of the number of classes they might be able to still take, depending on what that schedule is? Um, the contract, we have uh, agreements with our teachers association. What does that look like, right? When you think about the instructional minutes that a teacher might teach in any given week, prep periods and whatnot, all those things have to be looked at if you're thinking about shifting your, your bell schedule. Um, and certainly the district operations, budget, transportation, I think that's self-explanatory, but it's, it's complicated. That's hence why you would need somebody, a group to really take a closer look at what a potential schedule shift might do along those lines. These are some sample alternative start times that the committee looked at, just to give you an idea from based upon where we are currently with a 20 minute delay at the 612 level starting at 8 o'clock, uh, 820 and 840 with a 40 and 60 minute delay. Same thing at the K5 level currently. Uh, we start with an 840 start time, going to 9 a.m., going to 920, going to 940, and then looking at corresponding um, dismissal times along those lines as well. We had a conversation about, hey, well, maybe if you just flip the schedule, right? If you just looked at K-5 and 612 and you flip them, what would that do, right? So you can look along the chart here, um, pay close attention to late buses, for example, at the middle school, at the middle school and high school level where many of our students participate. How does that impact family time? How does that impact things that a student might do? Uh, how does that impact something as random as our facility use, right? Outside groups are coming in to use our facilities, for example. So, um, and keep in mind, these are um, the times that, that they would be picked up. So it doesn't necessarily represent when they would actually get home, right? Um, so you really have to think these things through. Um, and then we looked at what, depending on the time of year, when is the sun rise, when is the set, what are the temperatures, uh, is a parent of an eight-year-old going to be comfortable with their child at 7.15 at the bus stop uh, in January where it's still dark? You know, that's a fair question, right? Does a parent have the ability to be there at that bus stop, right? So there's a lot of little nuances that you might have to think through, but just to give you an idea of some of the, what the committee did and the conversations that we had along the way. So thinking about the best bell schedule committee, what would be the impact? Um, certainly on the instructional program, I mentioned uh, if you start shifting a, doing, going to a different schedule, um, you would have to take a look at that. Some people have said, hey, well, why can't you at the high school level just get rid of study halls, right? Until you start to realize that study halls are one, help us from a capacity standpoint, Right? Two, are used for students that might participate in extracurriculars to actually study during the day and have that opportunity. Three, are provided specific supports for uh, students with special needs. Four, access their school counselor. Right? Five, access other things that may not be able to access when they're in a class. Right? So there's a lot of things, not to mention financial literacy, which comes out of our study halls as well. So there's a lot of things you have to start thinking about when you go down that road. 
Um, the staffing, of course, right? If, if a, a staff member is choosing to come from one district to another, or you're hiring practices, what does that look like when all of a sudden that schedule shifts, right? Does that put you at a disadvantage compared to other districts? Um, contracts, I mentioned that, the budget, transportation, the list goes on and on when you start thinking about these things, which is why you'd really want to have a, a, a committee specifically looking at alternative bell schedules and really taking a deep dive in that area. Third recommendation would be a transportation study. Transportation is, is probably the biggest, one of the biggest obstacles uh, in moving this type of work forward. Uh, about three weeks ago, I, I had the opportunity to attend two different um, sessions at New Jersey School Boards Association on school start times. Uh, I raised the same question in both sessions about regional school districts such as ours, with the footprint such as ours, with as number of buses such as ours, and said, well, how would you move this forward? What about busing and what about this? And both times, two different presenters said, I'm not really sure how you would do that in a district of your size, right? And people want to talk about some of the smaller districts that have done this work, and that's great, and more power to them. But you really have to think about our transportation here specifically, which is why one of the, reasons, one of the sessions that we met was really taking a deep dive. Mary Pearson was great in helping me put together a lot of this information uh, that I'm going to share with you here, just a, a quick um, snippet. So when you think about the shifts, uh, bus route efficiencies, capacity, safety measure, estimated costs for changes, this is something a, a transportation study would do for you. Now, albeit a district of our size, you're probably looking at anywhere from fifty dollars to $100,000 and having somebody come in and really look at all your routes and give you a full report, analyze everything, do the research, and look at these different facets. Um, so going back to transportation facts, we've, this is a snapshot we took uh, this summer of, of 92, 54 total students, of, of which 96%, 97%, requires transportation, that's a huge percentage, right? That doesn't, what, what our transportation needs are here in WWP are different than neighboring districts, are different than a lot of other places. There are some similarities, and I'll talk about those conversations I had a little bit later. Uh, 10 schools, 39 square miles, uh, it is a large system, right? We have uh, some of our own uh, bus routes uh, on our own bus drivers, our own buses. We have transportation staff. Um, when you think about the overall budget, and just look at the numbers in the last five years in terms of transportation costs, and this isn't just WWP, these are other districts, uh, across, this is across the state, right? So when you think about shifting a school start time and look, putting in different parameters, what potentially would that do to your transportation costs, which in WWP projected $17 million of, of, the, of the district budget, so upwards of 10, 11%, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, Dr. Russo could probably correct me on that, but you can see the costs increase in the last four or five years, right? And now this, this, does this become cost prohibitive when you start thinking about all the different pieces that are involved here and what it could do to transportation? So looking at that and you think about transportation as well, you have to consider things such as student pickup and drop off times. I mentioned the example of an elementary student at the bus stop early in the morning. Are parents going to be comfortable with that? Right, teenage drivers um, driving home in the evening hours after a long day. Are parents comfortable with that? Bus driver, contractor availability, all of a sudden you shift your start time. Is your contracted bus uh, services able to accommodate you? A lot of busing companies in the last five years have gone out of business. There are not a lot of options out there, so you have to really think about that before you make the shift. Um, and needless to say, the transportation budget in and of itself is something you really have to consider uh, what that costs if you reroute, um, redo your bus routes. Um, and it's not just WWP. A lot of our routes and a lot of other district routes are dependent on other districts nearby. So there are other factors that you really need to think about. The other topic that I think is worth mentioning is residential sending paths. Everybody's aware, middle school and high school, we, we cross bus. Right? Are we ready as a community to have that conversation about residential sending paths? Um, your one child went to Grover and South. You love Grover and South. All of a sudden, you have to have that conversation about your child going to CMS or, or High School North, which respectively are great schools, right? But are we ready to have that conversation? That's a huge conversation.
Recommendation number four, district collaboration. Anytime you venture down this road, you of course need to lean on colleagues in other districts, specifically districts that have similar um, footprints, uh, similar uh, geographic size, student enrollment, the number of schools uh, that might be changing their start times. In this particular case, uh, I had really good conversations with both Hopewell Valley, who considered uh, a start time shift a few years ago. Ultimately, it was cost prohibitive from a transportation perspective. Bridgewater Raritan, which is similar in terms of the number of students and geographic footprint, uh, which is currently reviewing this now, uh, but is at the moment not pursuing this uh, for a variety of different reasons, one of which, of course, is transportation. So this would be something that you would be wise in collaborating with other like districts in terms of that geographic size, the number of students, the number of people that are uh, leveraging transportation in a given day and year. So when we think about New Jersey um, overall, the average New Jersey high school start time is 7.51. Um, you can look that up. There was a recent article on NJ.com that highlighted what the average start time was uh, because this is a conversation that is happening around the state. Um, I would argue that if you look closely at that data, what you will notice is that many of those schools that start after 8 a.m. are counting vocational and tech schools that require longer distances to travel, hence why they have to start later, right? So our school start time is 7.40 a.m., um, albeit that that's certainly something that is um, a little bit earlier, but by 11 minutes. So we're, we're somewhere right around the middle, but again, I would argue that it's actually less it's earlier than that based upon the information I just shared. Um, looking at our school day versus a lot of districts, at specifically at the high school level, we have a, a higher than average school length of our, our, when we think about the amount of instructional minutes uh, that's in our schedule. So if you looked at that and, and wanted to modify that, what are you giving up ultimately? So that's something you want to definitely take a look at. Um, Pending legislation, there's actually two bills uh, in, in, in New Jersey uh, that potentially down the road could require all public schools to move in this direction, uh, similar to what happened in California, similar to what <clears throat> just happened in Florida. So this is something when you think about timing that you want to keep a close eye on. Again, I mentioned my conversation with Bridgewater Raritan about where they are and going through this process. Very helpful to have that conversation with their district superintendent uh, and share ideas and talk about different challenges that they're facing and the conversations that we're having here. So when we think about the school start time from a district collaboration perspective, you know, what's what, the other thing is the state pilot program. Pre-pandemic, uh, the state had put out for schools to participate in a pilot program. At some point, that pilot program will likely come back um, to get more information about the effects of school start time the, on, on student outcomes. Uh, pending legislation, I mentioned, the timing of a transportation study. Does it make sense knowing that we have uh, pending residential growth coming in the next few years? That, that's a fact, right? You just have to drive around and you can see how many shovels are in the ground, how many houses are going up. Um, there will be changes in enrollment. So is it something that you want to spend X amount of dollars on a transportation study now and then redo that two or three years, four years down the road? The fifth recommendation is around health and wellness. And I would argue that this might be the most important recommendation of all before you even go further in this conversation. Um, you think about uh, sleep, nutrition, and exercise. I have two teenagers at home. I have a ninth grader and an 11th grader. They're both honor roll AP students. They're student athletes, they have busy schedules. It is a constant conversation in my household about getting enough sleep, um, making sure you're eating right, of course, making sure you're exercising. So I, I get it, I, I'm living it every day. Um, and it is a challenge, but we, we manage and we make it work. Uh, we make it work in the sense that it's rare that my children are up past 1030 at night, but that is a constant. And I'm not saying that that means that everybody can do it, but I'm saying that if you really put a focus on this and have a conversation constantly uh, with students about the importance of this and make specific choices, I do believe it can be done. Um, part of our process with the committee was looking at the current research. 
Um, when you think about what the American Academy of uh, Pediatrics says, um, there's no question that this is the challenge, not just in WWP, but across the state, across the country. But I do want to highlight part of this statement that was put out in 2014. Um, sleep associated with, I highlighted here, lifestyle choices, academic demands, negatively affect middle and high school students' ability to attain. Of course, getting up earlier will do that based upon their natural uh, rhythms and uh, their circadian rhythm and whatnot. The science, nobody on the committee disagrees with the science. We all agree that the science speaks to adolescents naturally wanting to go to bed later, naturally wanting to sleep a little bit longer. Um, but we need to have a conversation about health and wellness. You need to have a conversation about how important it is when you think about which classes you're going to take for next year, right? I would argue if you want to increase stress and anxiety, take that fourth or fifth AP course, right? That will do it, right? But if you want to think about um, getting, having a more manageable schedule, uh, being able to balance and have the importance of sleep, exercise, um, nutrition, um, that if you end up taking a more balanced schedule in, in light of your extracurricular activities, that you will likely be more successful in getting adequate sleep. The American Academy of Sleep Medicine, this is other, also additional research that we looked at um, as part uh, in, in looking at these statements. We looked at some other studies that were done across the country. We looked at the work that was being done in California and Minnesota. Um, we had a lot of conversations about the science behind this. And as I said before, nobody disagrees with the science. It is evident that they, they will see some, some of these uh, risks of accidents, injuries, hypertension, other illnesses and depression go down. But again, some of that is also lifestyle choices. So thinking about the last recommendation, health and wellness education, uh, this is something that what would be that, you know, outcomes uh, on health and wellness, on adolescent sleep patterns, on mental health, pupil attendance, academic performance. Um, the, the, I think the jury's still out a little bit. There's mixed results when you look at the research that's done in California. There's some anecdotal information being collected in places like Chatham where this work is, has already happened. Um, again, some research is still being done, but these are the things you want to look at. If, if the state moves forward with a pilot program, getting that uh, information would be very, very helpful to understand what is that out, uh, impact on student outcomes. That being said, um, I know I spent a lot of time going through this, and I feel like I've just scratched the surface in terms of the work that the committee did over the last six months. But I think anything that we do, we will always want to stay focused on our strategic plan, uh, be it student-centered learning, global competency, social-emotional learning, and equity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McDonald. Um, are there any questions from board members? Liz? Um, first of all, Dr. McDonald, thank you very much for this very comprehensive and holistic uh, summary presentations, many months of hard work in addition to everything else that you do. So thank you for that and everyone who's participating in the committee. I just uh, had a question with regard to California and how they were able to implement, you know, um, was having the statewide legislation helpful? I think if you can. Sure. Um, everything that I've read, and it's been a lot, uh, with, is that it was very helpful. Uh, having a statewide mandate. I think that there are lessons learned, though, about shifting to this uh, within even a two-year time frame. And when you look at uh, the various research that's out there and the articles that captured kind of what's happened there is that there were things that they didn't anticipate, but they just expected certain things to happen and fall in place, but child care was a huge one. Impact on student families, uh, inequities that occurred that they didn't necessarily um, fully understand which and when you think about the work that we're trying to do here is really get an understanding of those issues. Uh, so I think there's definitely some lessons to be learned. When you do something like this, it's kind of nice not to be the first ones, if you will, and learn from others as they go through that process. So um, I do think having a statewide mandate would be a significant uh, help to doing something like this. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, go ahead, Louisa. Uh, sure. Thanks to everybody that worked on it. Um, 
I'm a little disappointed. <laughs> I guess I was hoping for something more definitive, but I guess we know it's a very complicated issue. It's got lots of different aspects to it. And so you're basically saying that we've got to do a lot more work in order to reach a conclusion as to whether what we can and can't do in the district. Is that basically... Um, so, I'll, look, I will start by saying, one, if you want my personal opinion, I, when you think about all the different factors, I do not believe that this is the time or the place to move forward with this work. Um, what I am saying is that when you think about the recommendations, getting stakeholder feedback, to me, and really understanding beyond the committee, beyond just the Board of Education, the perspectives, is really critical. Um, I, don't, I don't know how you as move forward as a community and not seek that input. Um, that's why that recommendation is so strong. This is super complicated, so I think it's just understanding what the different factors are and being able to have an understanding that this, isn't, this can't just happen overnight. To me, you're looking at if you decided tonight that you were going to do this, it's a three to five year process minimum, right, when you take a look at all the different facets and how difficult this project would be. Um, and what the capacity and the bandwidth to do that would be. Um, so I think there's, in light of all the different things that are happening right now and the residential growth uh, that's been shared with the public in the last uh, couple months uh, from Dr. Adderhold um, and the other uh, factors such as the state conversation that's happening, um, my definitive answer right now would be, as, as my personal opinion and leading this work of this committee, would be that no, now is not the time to move forward with this work that perhaps in a few years when circumstances are different and uh, the state is in a different place, that might be the time to do it. Uh, even then, you're going to have uh, an immense challenge ahead. Um, so that would be my take on Okay, and was there a consensus of the committee or I just, not really? Oh, consensus of the committee would be that now is not the time, exactly what I just stated. Now is not, would not be the recommendation to move forward with this work. But again, that was, the, the committee was framed around the idea of, hey, let's better understand this before we just jump in. Um, but I think the entire committee, going back to the first night we met, even as somebody that's been a school administrator for 15 years, we walked out the door saying, wow, right, this is, this is not so clear cut. When you start thinking about all the different pieces and all the different potential shifts and impacts, it's not easy. Louisa, any, any other questions? Dana? I have a few questions. I want to say thank you to Dr. McDonald and all the people that, are, that were on the committee, many of whom I see in the audience. Um, I had a few questions. Um, you mentioned all the new development. And um, if, there's, if you can like, remind us how many students are, how many units um, were outlined that are already approved that Dr. Adderhold mentioned the last time he did that presentation and then approximately how many students would yield from those those um, new housing units and that's just what's already been approved. Then um, I, my other question was how likely do you think the state will move on the, the pending legislation? Do you have any idea of the timeline? Um, how much would a transportation study cost and um, if you were to recommend any of the five, moving ahead in any of the five recommendations, which ones would you recommend doing first and possibly a time frame for that? So, sorry, looted, four looted questions on you, but. Any more? Any more <laughs> no, that's it, four, four is enough. Um, transportation study, probably 50 to 100,000. Um, and, and Dr. Adderall, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's nine different developments in West Windsor and maybe three or four on, on Plainsboro side, upwards of 3,000 students. When you think about um, the next three to five years, maybe 2,500, give or take. At full build out, we, we're probably lower than that. We're probably looking at, it's 40,000 units. I can't it's 4,700 units, um, and I believe it was just, under, just over 1,500 students at full build out um, anticipated. Um, it was the October a board presentation. Um, as far as a time, next potential steps, uh, I think that the community 
survey would be something that would be worthwhile in terms of, and that was the consensus even of the committee, that you really want to get that feedback and trends and what's happening in the community and what people's perspective on this topic is uh, to better understand it. That there's, there's surveys out there that you could replicate. Yes, it would be work, um, but it wouldn't necessarily cost you a ton of money per se, right? Transportation study, as I mentioned, that's, that's, going, to, that's going to cost money. And the other question was about the state uh, legislation. How I really don't you think have you know sought kind of clarification. I think it's it's on the laundry list of things to revisit. But um, when you think about the interests, the conversations that are happening, um, the publicity on this, I think there's enough people out there that uh, I don't think it's going to go away, right? But in terms of when the state will decide to do anything, I couldn't tell you when that is. If I could just build on that, prior to the pandemic in the 2019-2020 school year, uh, the state brought forward a pilot, as Dr. McDonald referenced. That pilot, um, the ability to participate in the pilot closed for participation the first week of March of 20. And as you might all recall, it was Jan late January, February. We were all gearing up for the unknown of COVID. Um, no one was considering submitting an application at that point. Everyone was trying to understand what was happening in the world. And of course, then we went to, to, to a shutdown. Uh, there is, there's very rarely um, a major statewide shift like this that happens without a pilot. I would be um, surprised if one of these bills moved forward um, without a pilot study being conducted. So that, that would be my take, and that's 15 years working on the legislative committee at the state level. Go ahead, Louise. So, Lee, you said that um, having a state mandate would move things along. I know there's the one view is that's because it's the mandate you have to do it. But I'm also thinking the state mandate also helps because it eliminates some problems. So if we change and nobody else changes, all of our, our sports schedules are all off from everybody else's, that if it's a mandate, then all the schools, sports, all those things change together. And that makes it easier. Is that why it makes it easier? Or is there anything else I'm missing about what makes it easier about being a state mandate? I mean, besides being mandated, that is a reason specifically when you think about your schedules aligned with everyone else's, shared resources, um, even shared staffing, shared um, you know, collaboration and, and alignment with sports schedules, extracurriculars. Everybody's doing it per se. Anything else a student might be involved in they're going to have to adjust too, right, if they want to continue to have their students participate. Um, so the, it's a ripple effect, if you will. But being able to say, hey, this is something that's required as of whatever, 2027, 2028, name the year, um, to me gives people, puts people on a little bit more of a level playing field in terms of being able to start to push this work further and make it a higher priority for districts. Again, if I could build on that just for the public's sake. Um, to Dr. McDonald's point, if the state came out and mandated high school start time to 8.30, um, I would 100% agree that that would um, help from the perspective of um, everyone having alignment at the high school level. But it is impossible, um, as it's an improbability that every school district in every school level, grade level, could start at 8.30. So the public just needs to understand that that would come at a ripple impact to, depending on your school community, middle schools and elementary schools. Um, in WWP, we basically have 50% of our community starting at one time and 50% happening at the other, right? We're, we're built on a middle school, high school as a very similar start time. And that those buses pick up the elementary kids and then the same happens on the opposite end of the day. So if high school goes to 8.30, in our district you need 40 minutes from drop off to, to when the elementary can be picked, dropped off the high school, middle school, to drive out, do the routes, to pick all the kids up, to come back to the elementary. You need essentially 40 minutes. So that means either the elementary is going to start early, um, 7, 7.50 at the latest, or they're going to start in, after 9 o'clock. So there will be residual impacts then for families. So just as long as everyone understands that a state mandate for high school start time um, does not mean it won't have a ripple impact for other grade levels. Liz? 
I just wanted, um, if you can please like elaborate a bit more on the inequities issue with regard to child care and EDP staffing resources as someone who has used, you know, aftercare programs for all four of my kids, you know, it was without EDP services, I wouldn't have been able to work and manage school. Sure. Um, I mean, the obvious inequity is the ability to pay, right? The ability to pay. And we've always worked with families when it comes to EDP and, and tried to make it as affordable as possible. But if all of a sudden you shift a certain start time, a certain grade level that's starting later or earlier, then that might create an increase in demand for before or after care, potentially. Um, the other idea is that not everybody is working remotely. Not everybody has a schedule that's flexible. Right? Some people have to be at work at a specific time. So they, they don't have that choice of shifting their start time or their end time. Some people do, some people don't. That's where it becomes a little, the inequity piece comes into play, and not to mention the financial piece as well. So I think that's, that's really the, the primary issue. Uh, then you start thinking about single family uh, or single parent uh, homes right, that might have a different structure and might have limitations in terms of their capacity to, to care for their children before or after care, it, it puts them in a tough spot depending on their individual circumstances. That's something I think would be important to kind of gather as part of a survey. Oh, Robin? You know, and I, I can't remember if we brought this up in committee or not, but um, I guess one question too is, for if it was state mandated, is there technically funds then for like EDP and that would be able to, you know, I know we mentioned the EDP like currently right now is like really tight and, and at capacity. So if there was a mandate, would there potentially be like state issued funds to help that? And I can't answer specifically on whether or not there would be state funds, but I mean, we do have resources that we leverage. Um, we try to work with families if they're on a free and reduced uh, we try to work with families if they have some sort of hardship. That's something we've always tried to do. Uh, Shannon Martin and her staff are, are excellent about doing that and understand personal circumstances. Um, there's other community agencies that will help when a student, when a family, whether they're homeless, whether they have some sort of significant hardship. Uh, but I don't know that I would expect some sort of uh, additional funding for before and after care, but it, it's a fair question and it's certainly something that if the state moves in that direction that we would advocate for. You mean like unfunded like state mandates or? Yeah, it was more, it was, it was more the, I couldn't remember in, when California did it if they were had gotten funds to help with no, that. No, I, I do not believe so. I, that was one of the things that came about where it was like, hey, we didn't, as, as individual districts didn't necessarily plan or, or think about um, or th expect the potential ramifications of the child care, either not having enough child care on site in the district or what it might do in terms of from a capacity perspective to the private uh, before and after care too. And just not having enough options, period. I'll just jump in because the, we have an audience and, and just to educate the group is, is the, the state has not fully funded the education formula ever. So, so you know, there's a there's an expectation of what they they need to contribute to districts, and it, we have been an underfunded district for the 15 years I've been here. So they never fully fund the formula, and not only that, but based on what the state has done over the last five years, uh, they have been systematically defunding over 100 school district with what's called S2 legislation. All right, so there's over 100 school districts. Robbinsville is flat funded this last year, which essentially means with inflation they've gone down. Um, so there, there are districts, South Brunswick and Robbinsville, right next to us that are both in the situation of losing state aid. Um, so no, I don't think we should expect the state to save us in anything that they do, because that's why the term unfunded mandates exist in New Jersey, because New Jersey never fully funds anything they implement. And I apologize, I think I missed heard the question as far as our specific state funding, but well said. Are there any other questions? Braylon? Yes, thanks for the um, comprehensive presentation, but along the same lines of um, asking about state funding, I was curious about in your research and comparison to California, um, initially I was thinking about like, oh, well, did they you know, fund transportation? And I remembered, I 
pretty sure that someone said that they don't have busing in the state of California. Um, I don't know if you can confirm that. Um, but if they don't have that same issue, since transportation in New Jersey is one of our biggest challenges as far as cost, resources, availability, et cetera, but California didn't have that problem, um, I know one of their lessons learned was um, childcare issues. Did they have any um, other challenges they weren't expecting that they would have, um, that state funding could have helped them out with? besides child care? Um, I think it's the, when it comes to California, I did not see anything that confirmed that they did not have transport. I mean, obviously somebody's providing that transportation, whether it's a school district or some sort of alternative uh, source, but that did not come up in our research. And when we looked at different articles about what happened in California, both before and after, uh, I think it's a lot of those, if you think about, there was 25 questions in the presentation after each, five after each recommendation. I don't know that many of those questions were necessarily fully vetted and understood before this mandate was put into place. That's my guess because when you start thinking about things such as inequity with childcare, when you start thinking about things such as um, work schedules, uh, family different, family dynamics and what, how it impacts an individual family, part-time jobs, those are a lot of the, if you, if you just, you go online and you just start looking about what's the feedback after year one, year two of, they're in the second year now in California. Those are, I think, some of the problematic pieces that they um, are now seeing a ripple effect uh, from. Without still fully understanding, did this make a difference in student outcomes? I think that that's still the question, right? Did they see less mental health referrals? Did in uh, attendance increase? Did grades go up? I think there's, but that question is still there. Thanks. Um, any other questions? Just to just to build on this, because um, I, I, it's I, it's popular to look at like California because they did a statewide and it's one year in, so there's no data, there's no testing, there's no residual, there's no comparables over multiple years, so it's hard to know. But look at a district. We need to look at like regional districts in New Jersey that are high school only. So you look at Freehold Regional. Freehold Regional has six high schools. Right, so they're a perfect scenario of why can't a regional high school move to one bell schedule. Well, they have 10,400 students, 200 square miles. They have three high schools on an early schedule, three high schools on a late schedule. And they do that because of the busing costs. So again, transportation is a huge driver here. And until we can solve that aspect, we're, this, this is going to be a big challenge financially for districts. So it's just something that's going to be an inevitability. And that's a regional high school that does not have to think about middle school or elementary. Um, and, they, and they have two splits, and they have a split schedule. And that's true for Lenape. That's true for all the regional high school districts. Any other questions from board members? Okay, I, I did actually have just one quick one. I know there was mention too about just impacts on athletics and extracurriculars. I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on, some, on what some of those impacts may be with later start times. I know, um, I, I think I had at least heard um, conversation or talk about what that could mean for that last period um, for the of classes. So I just wanted to get a better understanding of what some of those impacts may be for athletics and Sure, so starting backwards, the potential loss of instructional time when you have to release students because your high school goes later. Game times, you know, the CVC and the county for that matter is not gonna shift four o'clock start times for games, for example. So if you got an away match at Hopewell Valley, get on a bus, you need an hour, right? By the time you get there, you get it, right? Get warmed up, whatever. Um, so it's things like that. Um, when you think about, uh, I'm a, I have children of my own and I coach in WWP, but my child's schedule is completely different now than what, and my ability to get to daycare is compromised because I cannot. Am I going to continue to take that three to $4,000 stipend knowing that I'm already having to increase my costs on daycare? Maybe, maybe not, right? Um, lighting, lighting would be another. We don't have lights at the middle school fields. So middle school gets out later that's another expenditure that, guess what, if you want to continue athletic participation at the middle school level, we need to figure that out, right? So those are just some of the examples that came up with, with athletics and what does that do to your participation rates, um, referee availability, 
transportation is another one too. Now you're asking a bus to come at a certain time, um, you know, things of that nature. Okay, thank you. And then um, just another question real quick on one of the recommendations for district collaboration. Are, are there school districts now that do this in the area that do this type of district collaboration that was mentioned here? On this topic, um, no, I had to seek them out, but I mean, we people know what Princeton did a few years ago. Um, you know, had a conversation there. They shifted the time 20 minutes. I don't know that it's made a difference truly in terms of outcomes and whatnot. Um, I, my conversation with them, you know, truth be told, was limited because the people that made that decision and moved that forward are no longer there. Um, but uh, Bridgewater Raritan, for example, is going through this process right now. They're a little bit ahead of us in terms of just having those conversations. They went out for a transportation study. They did some of that work. Uh, Dr. Beers was very helpful in just having that, but I sought him out, right? I looked at different districts. I talked to Dr. Lasusa up in Chatham. Um, again, very different setting. It's, it's apples to oranges when you talk about us versus Chatham, us versus Princeton. Some of that geographic layout, the transportation alone puts us in a completely different category of uh, the number of students taking transportation, 96%. So um, there are other districts that are maybe having the conversations based upon what I saw at school boards, uh, but not too many that are actively going down this road and saying, you know, we are either intending to do this or we're in the process of better understanding it yet. Okay. Thank you, Dr. McDonald. One last call. Anyone else have any questions? Okay. Thank you, Dr. McDonald. And I You're do welcome. want to also just say um, I see a number of committee members, I believe, are on in the audience. So I just want to thank you, Dr. McDonald, but also thank our committee members who are, you know, members of the community. Thank you so much for all the time that you put into these committee meetings um, over the last six months. We really appreciate that time um, that you all gave and volunteered uh, to be part of this study. So thank you very much for that. Okay, so now I will turn to the first opportunity for public comments. The board invites thoughts and reactions on agenda items and items of concern from members of our community who are present. Each participant is asked to give his or her name and address prior to making a statement, which will be limited to three minutes in accordance with board policy 0167. All statements shall be directed to the presiding officer. This public comment period shall be limited to 60 minutes. Are there any public comments? Good evening, my name is Ginger Gold Schnitzer, for taking those, there's no hyphen between Gold and Schnitzer. Um, I am the president of the West Windsor Plainsboro High School South Pirate Marching Band Boosters, and I come to share good news. Um, on November 5th, the Pirate Band competed at the Atlantic Coast Championships in Hershey Park, and we came in second in class 3A, but even better. This trophy is a plaque over there. Um, <laughs> the better part is that we achieved a score of a 93. And so that means in Tournament of Bands, the league in which we compete, we have been invited to compete in open class. There are three classes of bands in the Tournament of Bands. We have been at the A level, and because we scored over a 92, um, we are invited next year to compete in open class, which competes under different rules, and we compete with the most talented, um, bands in the state. Now, you might remember that High School North, our sister school, their band achieved open class last year. And now we've got a perfect fit, right? Both of our high schools are going to be competing in open class. And that's amazing. Uh, it was such a moment, I can't even tell you, when the North Band was there and they had performed hours ago and they were there cheering us on and so excited when their sister high school also got to open class. So that I want to say on behalf of the, and there's a lot of parents in the boosters here, on behalf of the boosters, I want to thank the music directors. I want to thank the music teachers, and not just at the high school, but this kind of success for two high schools does not happen unless you have a commitment to music all the way through in the district, the elementary schools, the music schools. This is where we see the success. So with that, I, uh, I want to share that good news. I want to thank you. Now, you know, in addition to thanking you, we're going to be in open class. We're going to be competing with all these new great bands. So I am respectfully requesting on behalf of the boosters 
that maybe this year you consider if you have an opportunity to put some money in the budget for some uniforms, that would be so <laughs> awesome. That would be. I tell you what, this is such a special moment for me because I am a graduate of West Windsor Plainsboro High School, the building that used to be South. I, uh, I graduated 19... Uh, <laughs> or I'll tell you because it's important for this moment. I graduated in 1986. My daughter plays my trumpet in the high school band, Ooh, in nice. my same band. And my daughter is wearing the same uniform I wore. <laughs> no, not really. She's not yeah. wearing the same uniform. But the uniforms we have are from 2011. And so anyway, I hope that there'll be some opportunity to, to review that with you. I know we have a very supportive board, very supportive music department staff, very supportive supervisor. So thank you very much, and uh, here's to future success in the next season. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Good evening, all. Uh, this is Milin Manurkar, Princeton Junction. Um, so. I just wanted to bring up that uh, late start topic again. I uh, just wanted to know like, what's next now? Like, is this dead now that we're not gonna pursue anything or are we going to continue to explore? That's the first question. And the second one is, uh, one interesting uh, topic that I saw on the slide today, that I learned today, was that average New Jersey school timing is six hours, 40 minutes, and ours is seven hours, 10 minutes. So the 30 minute period, um, and I also, uh, there was a remark made where if everyone is on the same page across the state, then it's easier to implement. So why don't we come back to the average time? And I saw there is an alternative option given like 20 minute, 40 minute, and one hour. All three options were explored. Can one of those options be considered uh, bringing our timing to a six hour, 40 minute school time instead of seven hour, 10 minutes? Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Hi, good evening. My name is Karan Vahid, uh, Prince Introduction. So I want to bring your immediate attention on the shortage of the uh, reading recovery teachers at the Marisoc School. So uh, Mike uh, Elderborn, he's a grade two, and uh, at the time, like last year, it used to be the seven reading recovery teachers. But now in the grade one, it's, there is uh, just a two recovery teachers. So uh, like the, the students, uh, like my, I mean, my younger kid, is, he's in the grade one, and he's not getting any uh, reading recovery teachers uh, at this moment in the Morris House School. So like uh, it, last year, it used to be seven, and now it's just a two. So the teacher does not have any support from the uh, reading recovery teachers, and also the students, like they're not getting any um, uh, like uh, any facilitation from the from any other re reading recovery, so uh, right now we have the uh, little shortages of the teachers in uh, re reading recovery teachers in the Morrison School. So that's something which you can uh, look into. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other comments? Okay. Uh, all right. So. With that, I will close the first opportunity for public comments. Just a couple quick responses. First, congratulations to our marching bands. Uh, I was waiting for the ask, so, but congratulations. <laughs> congratulations all the same. And, and uh, we'll definitely take a look into that and speak to uh, Mr. Santoro. Um, with respect to the uh, question about what's next, um, uh, first of all, I think, um, Debbie, you might want to talk to the gentleman about joining negotiations because um, <laughs> uh, the length of <laughs> the length of time is, in a schedule is is negotiated as part of the contract, and that's one of the things that was referenced uh, by Dr. McDonald in, in the contracts. Um, so one of the reasons why the boards, and it's not just the the current board, but boards over time have sought more contact time between teachers and students is to have a richer curriculum. Um, so we do have the opportunity in WWP for our students to take seven academic classes or 35 credits at the high school level per year. That's 140 uh, credits uh, over a four-year period. Um, in many other districts, um, it's 30 credits, 
so they take um, six or seven uh, classes, or they might have lunch and then seven. Um, so we do have a study hall built in as well, but if you lost 30 minutes a day, you would have to change the entire curriculum offering and would drop a class and then rework the periods so that you're on an eight period instead of a nine period schedule. Um, so it, it would have a significant impact to our the academic programs kids can take, the number of elective offerings for students, the number of AP classes, the, the, the levels in which students could reach. Many of our seniors and juniors take more than one science. Um, they explore elective opportunities. They might take four years of moral languages. They may stay in music as a result of the fact that they have that room in their schedule or explore the arts. Um, many other districts, and I was a high school principal prior to, to, to uh, leading this work, um, many other districts have, don't have the depth and breadth of instructional program that we have at our high school. So that would just be something that would have to be weighed should we um, decrease instructional minutes. And with respect to reading recovery, that's a very specific question for um, a specific child. So I'll answer it generally, and, but then invite an opportunity afterwards to, to maybe have a conversation. We have a reading recovery teacher in the audience. Um, but the number of reading teachers in the district has not decreased um, at, at any of the schools. Um, so we've made sure that we've actually increased intervention support. Um, what reading recovery, though, is a very, just for the good of the group, is reading recovery is a very specific program for first grade. Um, um, so, so, but there are other intervention models that exist at the, uh, the pre-K or the K-5 level. Um, so there are other interventions. So it's very specific based on the needs of a student. Uh, there's intervention cycles. So the, the model uh, and the interventions do exist. Um, so that's a, a conversation we can explore with individual families um, separately, not necessarily for a public conversation, but the number of total district interventions has not decreased. Um, so I'll, I'll, leave it, I'll leave it there. Um, thank you. Thank you. Actually, if I, I can also add to that as far as the what next question. Um, the majority of board members, this was the first time that we were hearing the report as well and the recommendations. I think for most of us, um, after hearing these recommendations, it's, it's a matter of absorbing what, what those recommendations are and determining what next steps are. So I think there was a question on what's next or if this is dead. I think um, the answer is, you know, I, I think we have to take in what the report and recommendations are that we heard tonight and figure out what that is. So um, we were hearing, many of us were hearing it for the first time as well tonight. So just wanted to make clear that that's, we are going to look at these recommendations that we've heard this evening. And of course, that was the result of a, a lot of the great work that you all did. So thank you. Okay, so with that, we'll go to um, the next item on our agenda, the Board of Ed Committee Report. So can I have the Administration and Facilities Committee, uh, Dana? Yes, good evening, everyone. Um, the Administration and Facilities Committee met on Tuesday, November 7th. The committee reviewed the policy and regulation 1642.01, which is sick leave, which are recommended for a first reading at tonight's meeting. Um, the committee next reviewed uh, several other policies and regulations which are recommended for a second reading and approval at tonight's meeting. They are um, policy 8500, food services, um, policy and regulation 3212, which is attendance, policy and regulation 4212, which is also attendance, policy 511 and regulation 511, and that's eligibility, eligibility of resident and non-resident students. The committee reviewed um, several other policies and regulations that we're recommending to abolish at tonight's meeting, which are policy and regulation 3432 for sick leave and policy and regulation 4432 for sick leave. Next, we heard an update on the referendum projects. Phase two construction at the Wyckoff School continues with renovations to the new to the new main entrance, main office, and the nurses suite nearing completion. Construction of the sensory playground at the Town Center School has been completed. Permitting for the uh, media center renovations at Maurice Hawk and Village School continue. We also discussed athletics. The athletic department is submitting a cooperative sports application to continue with the United Football Program, which is the program with um, North and South students working together on a United team. The committee discussed next steps regarding the possibility of starting a cricket program. Um, 
and also winter sports will begin later this month. The committee discussed the first draft of the 2025-2026 academic calendar. Additional stakeholder feedback will be solicited before approval is considered by the, by the Board of Education. We next discussed possible alternative programming that will be housed at the 72 Grover's Mill property. And finally, we got an update on the School Start Time Exploration Committee. That committee met on October 16th to finalize recommendations to, to present tonight. And that we um, discussed the proposed recommendations that were presented tonight by um, Dr. McDonald. And then the next committee will meeting will be on Tuesday, December 5th. Thanks. Thank you, Dana. Are there any questions from board members? OK. Uh, next, we'll have the curriculum committee report. Pooja. Thank you, Rachel. The committee met on November 7th, and we discussed the NJ Smart School performance reports. Uh, Dr. Dr. Gould shared the annual district submission for the NJ Smart School Performance Report. The site becomes live in the spring of 2024. We also discuss the 2024-25 program of studies, which you had the pleasure of hearing tonight. Dr. Gould reviewed the changes being proposed for the 24-25 program of studies. Um, let's see. The committee also reviewed additional items which are up for vote for today. The committee recommends the acceptance of the amendment of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act Entitlement Grant from the state of New Jersey for the fiscal year 2024, which was originally approved for submission in, on July 25, 2023. And it is to include prior year carryover. And the breakdown of the funds is in the agenda. The committee also recommends the approval of the tuition agreement with the College of New Jersey for placement of one student into child growth and development dual enrollment during the 2023 and 2024 school year at a cost not to exceed $500. The committee also recommends the approval of the professional development consultant New Jersey Coalition for Inclusive Education to provide a one hour adaptive PE professional development workshop inclusive best practices and adapting physical education for K through 12 PE teachers on November 15, 2023 at a cost not to exceed $500. And the committee also recommends approval of two field trips, uh, high, school nor uh, sorry, high School South Model Congress to Yale University from November 30th, 2023 to December 3rd, 2023. The cost of the trip is approximately $550 per student and High School South Model Congress to Harvard University from February 22nd, 2024 through February 25th, 2024. And the cost of this trip is approximately $800 per student. And finally, the committee recommends the approval of community ed programs for the winter 2024 programs, which are all listed in the agenda. Uh, the committee will next meet on December 5th. Thank you. Thank you, Pooja. Are there any questions from board members? Okay, we'll go next to the Finance Committee report. Louisa. Thank you. The Finance Committee met on November 7th. The committee reviewed the financial reports for the month. The administration affirmed that there are enough funds to complete the fiscal year. The committee reviewed agenda items for tonight's board meeting, including a change order to credit the unused allowance for the completed parking lot at 72 Grover's Mill Road, disposal of outdated equipment, transportation bus evacuation drills and route approvals, professional development travel, and the district's receipt of Rod grant money for the state share of previous capital projects. Every year, the district needs to complete and submit an annual health and safety evaluation checklist. Staff reported that these were completed and will be submitted to the county office for their review. Staff updated the committee on construction projects in the district, including at High School North, the front office alterations are complete and past inspections. The tennis courts are damaged. Architectural and engineering review of the courts are underway to determine if the courts can be repaired or if demolition and rebuilding them is more cost effective. For community, design work is underway for the installation of an emergency radio enhancement system. It is expected that big do bid documents will be ready for a December or January bid. At Town Center, the sensory playground is complete. Uh, 
The contractor is addressing punch list items. The media center renovations are continuing after a short delay with the installation of light fixtures and HVAC diffusers. We are still waiting for other material deliveries to continue work on the space. At Wyckoff, design work on the gym floor moisture remediation is underway. It is expected that the bid documents will be ready for a December or early January bid. The HVAC project continues with plans to finalize controls integration. The evacuation plan was submitted for phase one of the Wyckoff project. We are waiting the final certificate of occupancy. The Wyckoff construction phase two is coming to completion. We are waiting on the furniture vendor to deliver and install the remaining furniture. As to the annual audit, staff reported that the auditor can present his findings to the Finance Committee on December 5th and present to the entire board on January 28th. Work on the 24-25 budget continues. Staff shared the budget calendar with the committee. As to food service, the district served 3,235 breakfasts and 48,003 lunches in October. We have spent 306,000 of the 412,000 of the supply chain assistance funds. These funds must be used to purchase unprocessed or minimally processed domestic food products. October is National School to Farm Month. Wait, National Farm to School Month? <laughs> During the week of October, you, you, no, I need you heard that, right? Okay. During the month of October, this is what reading ahead gets you. During the week of October 16th, Asian pears, green bell peppers, and Jimmy Nardello peppers were served. During the week of October 23rd, broccoli rabe, sweet potatoes, red bell peppers, and carrots were served. To use some of the $27,000 of the local food for schools, uh, also supply chain assistance funds. Thanksgiving meal boxes will be made for donation using food from local farms, including turkeys, sweet potatoes, cranberries, green beans, and carrots. The food will be distributed to families that participate in Send Hunger Packing or similar programs that have been invited to sign up. Currently, we have 55 families that have asked for the meal boxes. Sodexo staff, along with High School North student groups, will pack the boxes. Regarding transportation, staff reported that bus evacuation drills were performed in October. The committee discussed the quotes for approval for transportation quotes for approval for daily student runs, athletic activity runs, field trips, and the cancellation of two quoted routes that are no longer needed. Staff reported that in January, the minimum wage will increase to $15.13 per hour. The committee reviewed the hourly rate chart for the remainder of the 23-24 year with the higher minimum wage. The committee will next meet on Tuesday, December 5th. Thank you, Louisa. Are there any questions from board members? Okay. All right, so we'll now move to the voting portion of our agenda. Can I get a motion for administration items 1 through 8 plus the purple addendum, uh, Dana and Liz? Any questions or comments? Chris? Okay, start with Ms. Bonfield. Yes. Ms. Chenier. Yes. Ms. Ho. Yes. Ms. Krug. Yes. Ms. Shetty. Yes. Ms. Dovich. Yes. Ms. Dillon. Yes. Ms. Juliana. Yes. All right, we'll now move to the curriculum items. Can I get a motion for curriculum items one through five? Pooja and Robin, any questions or comments? Okay, Chris. We'll start with Ms. Chenier. Yes. Ms. Ho. Yes. Ms. Krug. Yes. Ms. Shetty. Yes. Ms. Dovich. Yes. Ms. Bonsall. Yes. Ms. McEwen. Yes. Ms. Juliana. Yes. All right, we now move to finance items 1 to 25, plus the blue addendum and the orange substitution. Can I get a motion for those items, uh, Louisa and Shweta? Any questions or comments? Okay, Chris? start with Ms. Ho. Yes. Ms. Krug. Ms. Shetty. Yes. Ms. Dovich. Yes. Ms. Bonsall. Yes. Ms. Chenier. Yes. Ms. McEwen. Yes. Ms. Juliana. Yes. All right, now we'll move to personnel items. Can I get a motion for personnel items one to three, plus the green, yellow, two pink, and orange <laughs> addenda? <laughs> uh, Graylin and Dana. Any questions or comments? Okay, Chris? Okay, we'll start with Ms. Krug. Yes. Ms. Shetty. Yes. Ms. Zovich. Yes. Ms. Bonsall. Yes. Ms. Chenier. Yes. Ms. Ho. Yes. Ms. McEwen. Yes. Ms. Juliana. Yes. 
Okay, and uh, in our agenda, we just voted on uh, retirement, so I'd like to acknowledge the retirement of Yuko Kravis, an ESL teacher from Wyckoff, who's retiring after 15 years in the district. So just want to thank, um, thank you, Yuko, for your years of service and dedication to our district, and best of luck to you on your retirement, so thank you. All right, so now we move to the approval of board minutes. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes for October 17th? Uh, Louisa and Liz. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any abstentions? Okay, uh, any board liaison reports? Any new business? Okay, that takes us to our second opportunity for public comments. The board invites comments from members of our community who are present. Each participant is asked to give his or her name and address prior to making a statement, which will be limited to three minutes in accordance with board policy 0167. All statements shall be directed to the presiding officer. This public comment period shall be limited to 15 minutes. Are there any public comments? My name is Avanti Kanditkar from Plainsboro. Um, good evening, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. Um, I want to thank the Board of Education, Dr. McDonald, the school, better, school administration and the community volunteers for their participation and their work on the committee. Uh, commendable, thank you. Um, we do look forward to more information and details on the recommendations presented today. As uh, Ms. Juliana has shared that many on the board have seen the presentation for the first time today. Um, we continue to believe that the benefits to our students' mental health and well-being far outweigh any and all of the challenges that I have seen um, through the presentation. Um, nothing is impossible. Um, the health and success of our students are a concern, and I believe that now is the time to take bold action to prioritize this. With that, I want to wish you all a good evening. Stay warm, and I will see you all soon. <laughs> good night. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Okay. All right, with that, we will close this second opportunity for public comments. Uh, so that takes us to the end of our meeting. Can I have a motion to adjourn? Uh, Pooja and Shweta, all those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Thank you, and good night, everybody. <laughs>